sorry, there was some coupling within the with the microphone. So, um, well, I think this is a um, very very relevant day for me, um, for many people, because um, I'm going to speak about something that has been central to my career for many years, and uh, from a practical point of view and from kind of philosophical point of view. And um, it, it's, it's great, really great to see this school happening today. And I think this is a result of the motivation of, of many different people sharing uh, this interest many years ago before this was in the in the mouth of everybody. And um, people from the Institute, people from SKA and beyond, as you can see in the program, and it was really difficult to to select speakers because there is so, so many good people there really advocating for, for open science. So how how did I get here? Well, um, okay. Next challenge is I'll do it here. Okay, so um, well, I'm I'm an astronomer. I'm a radio astronomer, and uh, since I started uh, my my work, I used uh, multi wavelength uh, information, and uh, quickly found out that it was not so easy to find radio data in the virtual observatory there were no standards i wanted to produce a multi wavelength analysis of of data working with large samples of galaxies and uh, i also worried uh, about how to share my results uh also a pr very practical thing that maybe many of you uh, encounter is how did I do this like a year ago? How can I reproduce my own results? Where are my, is this the last version of my my paper or my my software or my notes? And uh, so all, now many people is using different tools. At the time, it was not the, the standard. And then I thought that I, more people will be sharing uh, these uh, motivations. And that pushed me a bit into starting doing um, developing uh, standards for radio astronomy in the virtual observatory which was completely unexistent at the time but also uh a bit uh, some time later okay some time later when i was um, acting as the chair of the universe panel for starting grants um, I remember that uh, over coffee breaks, I shared with the people in Brussels my concerns about uh, many people uh, in the panels using some specific um, evaluations, uh, evaluation parameters that I thought were very restrictive uh, with respect to the CV of the of the candidate. So by speaking, as I said, over coffee, uh, the people at the ERC, ERC headquarters suggested that I could prepare some talk. Uh, giving my point of view about that. That was a lot of work to put all these things together. But at the end, uh, in the next meeting of the commission, uh, of the committee, we I presented a, a talk which uh, I named uh, Love for Science or Academic Prostitution. And I must say that uh, the name was not uh, uh, of my own uh, um, idea because there is there was this nature special on the... Um, on improving the way we use metrics on science metrics. And uh, there was an article saying that uh, research is, uh, this was in 2010, is reverting to a kind of academic prostitution in the sense that uh, we work to please editors and referees rather than, rather than, than really uh, increasing our knowledge of, of, uh, the, of the universe of, the, of science. So we try to confront uh, in the name of love or for science or academic prostitution, doing an activity because you really like it or doing it uh, because you are purchasing a, a reward. Of course, this is not so simple, but this was uh, the way we approach it. And then the next thing that happened is that um, I started coordinating the participation of Spain in the Square Kilometer Array Observatory. And this kind of prepared and uh, the perfect uh, environment in order to um, really launch these activities. And um, what happened is that uh, SKA uh, or was uh, organizing as uh, every every two years uh, a session on for the European open the, the European the, sorry the Euroscience Open Forum, 
for ease of, and uh, we propose them to organize a session focusing on how these big data infrastructures should uh, handle uh, the way to do science. They should address the problem on how are we are going to do science with this really uh, challenging data deluge that was coming. So we organized this panel discussing uh, this uh, particular aspect, which uh, has been, I think, the beginning of a very strong engagement of the SKA Observatory with uh, Open Science. And I think that is kind of a summary of how did I reach that. And that's why today for me, seeing together uh, SKA and the Institute and other people that I know over, over many years in uh, an Open Science School is, is really a big milestone for, for me and for many of us. So I'm, I'm going to, to develop a bit uh, this debate on whether Open Science is something really new or is something we, we really had before. Uh, what is the combination, how the combination of metrics and economy uh, reverts in a kind of uh, prostitution of the system? Tools that we have to do open science now, and uh, how can we do really open science in the, with big data science? I will end with a revision of, uh, of uh, the latest research assessments, uh, which are this. I must say this was not in my first talk about the topic. So I'm so happy to have a full section about that after 2013 when I gave the first talk about, about this and, and the impact that this has in many aspects of, of uh, society and, and the world in general. So I think that we are using many adjectives for science now in many different contexts. Uh, science is excellent or should be high quality or should be trustable in, I think at the end, science should be open, but um, I think we should go back uh, a thousand years in back in time and uh, remember that at the end, what we are asking now to be done was already uh, pioneered by, by Ibn al-Haytam. It was a um, scientist, a Muslim scientist who, really establish the the first principles of the scientific method that everything you do should be in science should be confronted and you should establish a protocol in order to uh, get the evidence that uh, about this uh, hypothesis this is something that uh, happened in uh, in the in the in, in like 1000 years ago and maybe we forgot <laughs> But then we, we had René Descartes, uh, who in just 400 years ago, is really established the basics of the scientific method. And this is the foundation of philosophy, philosophy of science. And uh, at the end, I think the summary is that science, scientific method, reproducible, open, all this should be the same thing. We shouldn't use different words for things that are fundamental to what we do. So, this is, this is uh, in conclusion, this is not a new concept, but uh, in fact, we need to use tools. We need uh, different kind of tools to implement these open science practices. And because our fields are evolving so quickly, these tools are also evolving and we need to be aware of which ones they are and what kind of things we have in, in our hands. So I think that uh, the next question would be, okay, um, you say open science is following the scientific method. I'm a scientist, so I want to follow the scientific method. And, and, and I, I think that's that's exactly how it is. But I, it's very important they want to, because it's not so easy. And otherwise, how can we explain uh, this, um, this questionnaire on reproducibility that was published in, in Nature? Uh, it was um, covering many different areas of research. And it uh, found that 70% of researchers tried to reproduce the experiments of other scientists and failed. And even 50% failed to reproduce their own experiments. And this is uh, equally, uh, this percentage is equally um, high for many different disciplines. So even so, I know because I, I have been speaking about this for a long time. I know that not everybody empathizes with this and, and think that uh, this is not happening to, to them. Uh, and I understand that very well because we do always the best we can and we invest a lot of effort in that. 
but uh, maybe I, I like very much this tweet and maybe we you can empathize with this and it's uh, good luck uh, when a postdoc leaves your, your team. Uh, kind of, you can download our code from this, this link. Good luck downloading the only postdoc that can make it run. So I think we know that many times postdocs let, left our teams and not always we were able to really build on top of what they did in order to continue. So what happened since uh, since uh, these four in these four hundred years ago? Uh, I think we are um, we have been uh, really reliant on PDF as a, uh, as our way to communicate uh, in science. In fact, uh, the PDF uh, embeds only forty percent of knowledge in publications in in sorry from science and in practice. And um, I think this is what I would like to to see as the full um cycle of research so i think that we should move from the pdf and we are doing that in fact uh, from the cycle taking into account the cycle of uh, research which is that i would like to start as we do we define the problem we design the method we want to apply and uh, but i would like to first have some repository where i could find methods I mean tools or software, etc., from different disciplines, and really be able to search not only in, in astronomy, in my case, but in mathematics or biology, etc., and find something, being able to inspect it. What this means, like all the, the things that uh, this has to contain, so I, um, as an external person, can really inspect the software. And once I have it, modify it, make it make it uh, executable for my problem, and then I should close the cycle and publish this and preserve this, and uh, so someone else can find it and repurpose it or just use it for the same, just to check what I did and see if there was some, some problem. So, um, uh, but this is not easy. Um, there are many aspects that are considered here. Uh, on one hand, there is the, the problems related with big data, and uh, the, the point that uh, not always we can access the, the raw data in an automatic way. We also need to produce catalogs with the uh, following standards in order to share all the data. The code also has to be accessible, findable in repositories, following some best practices, but also the environment of the software is, is, is key. We know how sometimes we update the computer and, and things that work before don't, don't work any, anymore. And uh, for this, I, I would like to, to forward you to, because I don't want to, <laughs> to give the talk of other people, I, I wouldn't be able to do that, uh, the talk of, of Mohamed Aglali uh, on, on, uh, on manage and a reproducible thesis. As uh, has been said in the, in the first presentations, there's the, all this is about following the fair principles to find, to access, to interoperate and to reuse. Uh, this is these fair principles are uh, is a bottom up initiative, but again, this is not easy. And I think there are two main reasons why this is not easy. Is easy. the effort is not always rewarded, and it's not easy to have the, the advanced tools required in order to fulfill the fair principles. And I think that one way to see that this is not so easy, and I'll read some of, of this, is this is the list uh, of um items that uh, the SKA uh proposed uh to evaluate in the in the last data challenge whether people analyzing simulate simulated data from that uh, were a mimic of uh, future SKA data uh should uh, solve a problem and present the problem in a reproducible way so apart from the winners of the challenge in terms of finding a number of, of sources in the sky with the best fits to the parameters, etc. There was a list of uh, check a checklist in based on which uh, there was a number of awards the from from the up to the to the gold award and these three awards I I know that uh, not so many people were even trying to get the award and uh, very few people got one. But uh, some examples is related. Well, the, the left uh, column uh, corresponds to different areas that you have to cover. This is only for the software. Well documented, easy to install, easy to use, about the license you use, the accessibility of the code, the standards that the code should follow, 
and also the testing. Some, some, <coughs> sorry, some aspect is from giving examples in the documentation, some screenshots, uh, some tests. So you, when you download the, the, the software, you can really be you, be sure that you really are running it correctly to give all the dependencies and the how you document the code many many aspects that in fact uh, there were very few um, teams really winning on one of these awards so this is uh, just about the software but also there are different aspects uh, if you speak with different people that uh, cover the idea of open science and and the point is that this was this is so um, rich uh, in the community that unesco decided to um, uh, to issue a recommendation in order to homogenize this concept and this was uh, proposed in three in four axes four pillars uh, one is the uh, concerning in green here this is just rotating the same the same wheel in green here you have what is corresponds to the knowledge so is the data the software educational resources uh, the hardware as well open hardware the infrastructures now more and more the science infrastructures have an um, important role in open science, virtual infrastructures and physical infrastructures like EOSC or our observatories, and also the component related with the society. So that citizen science is also part of the of this uh, whole open science um, uh, ensemble. And uh, all this to be done in in a way, in an holistic way, and with a particular emphasis, emphasis in benefiting developing countries and promoting um, academic freedom, but also uh, taking into account the gender perspective and other, also the view that different countries, different cultures can have and contribute to, to open science. Sorry. So... I want to now to to stop in one of the aspects I mentioned is uh, what are the rewards that we have to do open science. And this is about the metrics of research, and um, I keep referring to this to nature because I think it was very very informative, very interesting about uh, science metrics. And one of the things I like uh, that is very very well explained here is that uh, we are really killed by numerical ranking the ranking systems are making us to pursue always high rankings and in sometimes sometimes forget about good science so that uh, we are in in a in a situation in which we want to pursue productivity and uh, sometimes we forget about the discovery and when i say we maybe it's not us but maybe it's a committee who is, who is uh, checking cities and our demonstration, a very fun demonstration of that we are sensitive to rankings, is this one. This is a, a journal, a standard journal on, on uh, physiolog physiological, sorry, psychological science, and uh, they were asking for many years people to share the data. This is 2012 to 2015. Uh, so what happened that at some point there where you see the data sharing increasing, they offer just this, a batch. People sharing the data will get this batch, just not. <laughs> well, this produced this change in the trend. So if you think that we are not sensible to rankings, I think we are. And about, about metrics of science, uh, we always have to put in our CVDH index. I'm not sure if you know that uh, you once you get an, an age index, you just go to a farm and start uh, growing, uh, I don't know, codes, and your age index will continue increasing even if you don't touch your computer for a year. So we have to be careful with every indicator. About citations, uh, there are also walls that, that have many years and still stand like... Um, projects, full projects dedicated, for example, to check the if there is any correlation between the referee process and the impact measured in citations. And in, found after, in fact, after uh, studying a lot of papers and comparing carefully what the referee said and what said the citations, there was very little correlation. 
we are not saying this is against the impact factor or is against the referring process, but it's something just to, to, to think about, food for thinking. And also some uh, studies about how uh, the reputation of, of the authors impacts the citation cycle of, uh, of a paper. And uh, it was very obvious that uh, more senior, more established, high reputation scientists could see very early the citation uh, index, the citation uh, number growing, while more junior people maybe reach the same number of citations, but much, much later. So reputation has an impact. But uh, furthermore, uh, citations, it is, it is known for 10 years now that only represent 1% of the usage of an article. There are many other ways to have uh, impact, to have uh, to spread knowledge that uh, the community is taking into account. But we also have to be careful. There are other ways like Twitter, but uh, I also like this example. This is a paper uh, which was speaking about some evolution of the environment in the quaternary. But at the end, studying why there were a lot, a lot of, of tweets about this was because there was this cute panda uh, image in the in the paper. So careful. <laughs> and um, we also speak often about the publish or perish uh, situation ha that we have now, that uh, even if we don't publish, we perish. But something that we might we, you might not know is that this this sentence dates to 1942. There's a, paper, a book that you can st still, still buy online, which is uh, The Academic Man, a study in the sociology of a profession. And it was already said there. So this is something that, that comes with us uh, for a long time. And, and something that uh, I have suffered myself is that uh, when you get a referee of your project and they say this project is incremental, I get worried because I don't know if this is good or bad. <laughs> and uh, at the end, it sounds like that because I think we all think that if we don't make a major discovery, uh, we are, our career is not going very well. But in fact, this is how the bulk of science is evolving through micro, micro improvements, micro uh, improvements in knowledge. So this is uh, something that really um, put us in a bad situation with respect to, to metrics. So you might ask, well, why are you speaking about economy and science? The point is that uh, I like also this definition about economy. Economy is about understanding how human beings behave when the resources are scarce. So the resources in science obviously are scarce. And uh, I think this has a bad influence from whoever you, you look at this. The candidates, when are, the candidates are pushed to get funds, uh, there are different kinds of advices that are not uh, strictly scientific, like it's very important, the title of your project is very important. Many people get this advice. 50% of the chance of success of your project is really find a very attractive title. But also from the funding agencies, it, it has a cost to have experts working a certain amount of time. So it, I think that all of senior people here has experienced the ridiculous amount of time we are supposed to spend when we evaluate proposals. And of course, some of this comes because it's, it's very difficult to, to pay a panel for a long time. So economy is there. But also <clears throat> you find things like, uh, what this is this is really a cocktail to have a marketing in, in, uh, in the game. And I, I really, I don't know if I like it or or not, but it's very sh shocking that uh, this marketing for scientists says that because sometimes unlocking the mysteries of the universe just isn't enough. What a pity! And from time to time, I receive this kind of emails. Many of you might might receive them. This is uh, emails about offering some kind of uh, of who you pay for that support on how to sell your idea to the funding agencies, because this is equally important to designing the project itself. So this is again worrying for the system. And the uh, other factor in economy is the cost of publications. This plot here shows in the horizontal axis the, the price to publish, the vertical axis the influence on, of an article. We very often say to our students, uh, go to a very important journal because you want to end their PhD with uh, papers in important journals. The point is that there is no 
a great correlation between the cost of a publication and the impact of uh, or the influence of an article. And uh, in the, main, the main piece of information is in, in the zero. There are many um, publications with zero cost, which are, are really range from the lowest to the highest ranking in, in impact. And also because of the cost of publishing, this sets a real, real disadvantage for uh, countries or environments where this is really a problem to pay for, uh, for, for publishing. So that's why uh, I, I speak about the system prostitution. The main message here maybe is not the word. Some, some people find it polemics, but I think what's important is that when what benefits the science is not the same that benefits the scientists, we are we have a problem, and I think we face that uh, very often. But let's be positive. Uh, what tools we have to really open our research? I must say that uh, astronomy is really pioneer in this. Uh, there is a virtual observatory uh, which was established in 2012. This is the really the origin of, of a fair principles applied to data in astronomy. Also, CDS is, is even previous to that, sharing data in online. Uh, so we are in a very good position, and in fact, we have a talk from Jesus Salgado from DSK Observatory about the virtual observatory. This was more about the data. This is more about the data. There's also, of course, software in the virtual observatory. <clears throat> but I think it's important to have a global view of research. <clears throat> And this is a result of a um, European project that in which we worked here at the Institute um, uh, ten, also 10 years ago, where the concept of research object was developed, like um, where it was uh, the idea is that the research object really gathers all components of research from the publication to the data, the metadata, the workflows, the slides, and the project was about how to expose the methodology uh, by providing examples, by providing annotations that are not only human, but machine readable, uh, the metadata, all the metadata about the processes and also the interoperability. We are now more and more familiar uh, about uh, the use of uh, ways uh, to share the code, um, good practices to share the code like GitHub, also to structure it in notebooks. Notebooks is something that astronomers seem to prefer with respect to workflows. So there are other disciplines that works workflows. Workflows are a more structured description of, uh, of the processes and are also very good to parallelize, for example, code in <clears throat> when you need to analyze big data. So there are just different tools. And I just want to stop uh, for a minute in, in a paper we published in 2019 about the study of a compact group of, of galaxies. You have an optical image to the right and the, a study with the VLA radio interferometer to the, sorry, to the left and to the right. And in this paper, we made a special effort in identifying a set of best practices to make the paper end-to-end -end reproducible from the initial data to the plots. So at the end, when you, when you go to the paper, you have links to Python notebooks so that you can reproduce every figure of the paper through a Python notebook. And of course, there's a description of the computational environment, etc. The I must say that Mike Jones, the postdoc who was working on this, was very worried because it took him more time than usual to finish the paper. And, um, and the, but he was very happy when the referee came back and said, please, this parameter was wrong repeat everything, changing the parameter, and just pushing a button, he could reproduce every every figure, every result of the of the paper with the corresponding modifications. Many talks about tools in this in this school, so I'll not continue speaking about that. We also need tools to publish in open. So there is the open access, there is the S coalition to speak to plan S about uh, trying to get everything in open access in uh, in the publications. But I think this more than than the papers, as we are seeing repositories, Roberto Di Cosmo is going to speak about the, the, the really wonderful software heritage project. So that uh, it's important to keep in mind there are different ways to share our research, which allows to, uh, to to share even audio, video, 
images across all fields of, of science and a great credit for that. This is very important for building your, your CV. And last in, the, in this part, for me, it's important to, to emphasize this idea from, from our, one of our collaborators, the, the great Carol Gobel. She's really a reference in, in open science in different disciplines. And is that uh, we should treat research as, as software. And in fact, we do it, but we don't admit it sometimes. When we publish, we want to publish something really closed, kind of a close research. So it takes longer to publish because we really need to be sure that everything is finished. But at the end, sometime later, it comes new data from a new observatory or come new, more, more data, a new tool, and then we revise the work. So the way we work would be more agile if we treat science uh, without uh, fear in by releasing science more than publishing science and uh, open, expose it and the community together can evolve it in different directions. So next next uh, point is uh, whether this big data science that, that is, is arriving now, is here now, is, is possible without open science. Because so far we, are, we have been kind of speaking about open science as an aim, but open science is a mean, especially for that. It's not only big data science or big data infrastructures are not only about uh, the data, are also about the large collaborations that are implied. So we need efficient ways to share not only computation, storage, but also the human resources, the collaborative tools, this uh, large alliance of, of scientists. So we need tools to enhance these scientific collaborations, but the platforms to share what is uh, associated to, to that. And this is about open science, any science. And, the paradigmatic case I mentioned at the beginning is the square kilometer array because it's going to build uh, radio um, telescopes in uh, Africa and Australia. But what is in this context more relevant is this is going to be the largest generator of public data in the in the world. So the challenge is going to be how to um, analyze this data. This is going to be done in a network of SK regional centers. As Isabel said, we are developing at the Institute in a prototype regional center, which is now fully functional, doing science with SK precursors. But this work is going to be done, all the analysis is going to be done in the science, in the regional center. It's not going to be done in the laptop of people. So it's really a shift in research practices. And the, the key ingredients in the regional centers to support open science that I try to summarize here is uh, in, we need a transparent access to the, to the data. So the, the scientists will not know where the data are, but we will have access to them have the software and the analysis tools, the visualization tools, also should know how the data are being analyzed and the provenance of the data. This enables uh, collaborative science. Behind that is the or reproducible notebooks, but also the, the opening to society through citizen science. And all this requires standards to interoperate the data. And of course, all this needs to come together, as we have said, with new metrics of research. Otherwise, there is no really support to do that. And in this in this um, new environment of uh, big data infrastructures, I like to stop a bit and think about the the point that we change the perspective now. We have been more about the thinking about individual users. We have, have been working more about individual users or, or small collaborations. Now with uh, bigger projects, we are moving to we need to in, to take into account what implies to work in large teams but also how the evaluators, the publishers, and the service providers see this, this situation in relation with open science. So um, I think that the, the view of the scientist and about working in a regional center is about trust. We often think that we have the best code and we don't want to use the code of someone else because we know what our code has. We don't trust uh, other pipelines uh, we know there is the reproducibility crisis, so why should I trust uh, other things? And sometimes I can hardly reproduce my own work. So in general, the, the individual user wants full control of the computational environment. But if we go to the data centers, that's, the perspective is different. It's about the technology, because if we bring software to the platform, the 
people in charge of the platform should really trust the software, be able to run it. And at some point we'll ask, uh, okay, I installed your software, but I can share with other users, right? Because I'm giving a service here. Do we really want to contribute with a software and being used by other people? Sometimes some people really like it. Some other collaborations are not so open. So it's, it's, it depends a lot on, on, the, on the large collaborations. And sometimes what people ask is some time in order to share the, the data. But, um, and also as, as we said before, it's not only about putting software in a platform, you need to provide the context so people can rerun it with other kind of data. Then we have this large alliance of scientists, which is growing, growing with SK is going to be uh, worldwide. And uh, this, these teams are already working with precursors, pathfinder telescopes in producing uh, tools to generate advanced data products. But uh, this is an effort that what's the reward of really making it usable by other people? Is uh, something that is going to pave, pave the way to competitors? Um, there are PhDs, should I protect the PhDs and not release the software until my PhD student finish the, the work? Then the publishers. The publishers are moving from to a different um, working model. Uh, now it's not only about uh, referring the date, the the, um, the paper, the the story we tell in the paper is about referring the data, uh, the software. So we the the journals need different kind of experts in order to be able to refer a paper if they really want to fully refer a work, and. Um, if the science is going to be done in the data center, should the data centers give access to the referees in order to be able to validate a paper? Are there really enough referees in order to do the job? And, um, and is this all together one thing or do we need to validate the paper in separate part because there are different experts? For the policymakers, this is also very challenging because uh, how do you measure reproducibility? And also, how do you aggregate different kind of indicators? That, that's, that's challenging. And for the infrastructures, I think that uh, in this case, uh, and I will repeat it at the end, I, it's both open science is really a need and a, and a duty with, with society. And in fact, this is something that already um, uh, is happening in SKA, where uh, uh, maybe Philippa is going to mention this, the foundational the foundational principles of SKA already include open science in its values, not only in the values, but also in the metric of success. So far, what at least I know is that observatories use a number of paper, access to archive and citations as a measure of, of success. Uh, the observatory is going to, to include, and this is challenging to execute that, as a metric of success, uh, the reproducibility of the science that is done with the, with the SKA. So probably Philippa is going to speak more about this uh, in her talk. And uh, finally, I will, I will speak about uh, the, how the way we evaluate research is changing and the impact it has in, in society. So, sorry, I'm going a bit, a bit slow. <laughs> Um, I want to, to emphasize that uh, open science comes bottom up. It was first different initiatives like the metric type, the Leiden Manifesto, who, that initiated the, the um, pushing for open science. These initiatives have also promoted the use of different metrics because the way we have impact in the community is uh, gathered in different ways, in different uh, uh, in the social web, let's say. And uh, there's also the Dora Declaration that in Spain was um, was signed by was adhered by the our national uh, research agency, which is an again an bottom up declaration in San Francisco in 2012 about uh, the request to in, to start a new way to assess uh, scientific careers. The European Community has been been very active probably since 2017 is when I find the first studies, different committees studying metrics, alt metrics, how to combine them, and also uh, the stating that we really need to reform the way in which we evaluate research. I don't want to, to go further into this because we have a pleasure today to have Eva Mendez and also we have the talk from Alexander Resfum about uh, uh, ways to, to evaluate and to, uh, and to present your CV following open science practices. 
and the community has been uh, also uh, advancing and in the same direction uh, again uh, pioneering ideas like uh, this is the hong kong principles again the community gathered together and issue these principles and in these principles we can see not only the reference to the five principles of, of science about responsible transparent open but also um, the value of diversity, diversity and recognizing uh, all contributions of the scholarship activity and taking all this into account has an impact in the in, in society and uh, that's uh, also established by the definition of the European Commission of Open Science, which is a um, collaborative approach, an accessible approach to science. But also UNESCO established that this is a way to democratize science and to achieve the United Nations SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. And I, I developed this in, in a talk. I will just summarize here how uh, SK or astronomy through open science can help to achieve some of the sustainable development goals. These are, uh, I put several examples. One is the um, acceleration of knowledge. We know this in epochs of pandemics is especially a time where we notice it. It's not only when we need it, but when we notice it. So open science really speed up uh, to build skills, uh, teaching, but also is a way to fulfill the partnership for the goals because there's a big part of the, our planet without access to resources. Uh, so this is a limitation to the progress of, of science in different parts of the planet. And we really need to promote the exchange of ideas and avoid duplication. It's also a tool to reduce inequalities in general. So it's a promoting equity, diversity and inclusion. And this applied to gender equality. And the idea is that um, when there is a hierarchy, there are a lot of contributions that are anonymized and behind the, the hierarchy or under the hierarchy. So open science ex exposes and allows an objective evaluation of, of work. This is my last slide before the conclusions. Here, different colors correspond to different, uh, different goals related to the sustainable development uh, goals, uh, sustainable development, democratization, education, trust in science. Um, I, we can start. Here, uh, we need the data. So this is how the SK regional centers will uh, help to fulfill the SDGs and other, of course, data centers or initiatives by making the data and the methods easier to find and, access, and being accessed. We will avoid reinvention. We will increase the production and accelerate the, knowledge, the transfer of knowledge to society. And also we, can uh, propitiate effective collaboration by making the data and the methods easier to understand. This has an impact in the multidisciplinary collaboration, but also in opening the science to, to society. And by opening these data and methods so everybody can scrutinize them, this helps to have reliable science, to increase the trust on science and prevent pseudoscience. And of course, all this comes with uh, new ways, new parameters to take into account when we evaluate science. So my conclusion is that uh, instead of playing the game, this is the time to change the rules. I'm so happy that uh, since the last 10 years I've been giving this talk, I had to include so many new slides with a lot of achievements. I think astronomy also is privileged, uh, is pioneer in this aspect, that doing this science as a scientist, uh, reproducible science is duty, and, but it's also a need. And uh, I think the infrastructures are an um, ethical role and a practical need in order to implement uh, open science. And this is the, the, the role that SKAO and the regional centers have really um, uh, take for them as, as uh, own their own. And that's why we co-organized this first SKA Open Science School together with the, the Institute Severocha program. And at the end, I want to leave the message that there is no such a thing as good science. I think there is science if we follow the, the scientific method. Thank you. Okay, we have some time for questions. Working up. 
Now should be working. Okay. Okay, good. I think that there have been a number of points very interesting that I'm sure that has promoted some questions, discussions. Okay, Julian. Thank you. Thank you, Lourdes, for this talk. So, uh, being a person that is promoting these uh, open science values for so long, uh, I imagine that uh, when you have participated in evaluation committees, you you probably have tried to, uh, like the committee should could try to take into account this, uh, the openness of the research in a way. So I just was wondering if, uh, did you find any resistance when doing this? Um... Well, maybe not resistance, but uh, uh, empathy. <laughs> not uh, not uh, not always empathy. Uh, I think that that helped a lot. That uh, there are really general rules, and that, the, for example, the national agency adhere to the to the DORA. But this is you need at, at least ten years ago. You need really to insist on. I don't want to see the age index of this person. I want to see what is written in this paper. And if I don't have time to read the 10 papers, I will read the first paper, but I want to read what this person did. And that's something is, it doesn't happen for different reasons and often is because of limitations. I found resistance and I, in one way I, I suggest to overcome that apart from top is from the bottom. And that's why we thought that it would be good to include a talk about uh, how do I prepare a CV where I really show my my work on open in trying to make my science open. And is if the evaluators start finding CVs where open science is presented as part of the work of the person, also the evaluators are going to be trained to read this kind of, of CVs and take this into, into account. Okay. Hello, thank you very much for the talk. I really share the same point of view as you do about open science. And I have a question specific about different levels of sharing science. So um, if I compare it to my work, I know that there are some things that are really made to understand only on a very low level, like uh, people that are in my field and other data that would be more public and usable. Would you say that there should be a structure of um, the the data that could be used in a very general sense, and the data that could be used like only in in small communities, and how to how to prevent that people use data that they don't understand to produce false results or software or or anything like that. Um, it's a very good question. Well, I think that um, the this is a problem because we don't have enough tools to make our science open. So you really need to worry about what level to share it. Misuse of the of the science is a risk of the data, is a risk for in general for even your own community. I think I've seen that in my colleagues just because we are in a hurry. And uh, so I don't think this is a risk only for people who are external. There is an advantage on making the same level of opening for external people. And we have seen in Galaxy Zoo, where the, with the green pea, if you are, I don't know if you're an astronomer, but if, with the green pea uh, objects. So uh, the point is, if you open to non-experts, they might misunderstand the data, but they are not biased. So they don't have an idea of what they should find. Of course, then you can come to the result produced by the citizen and do a kind of uh, more formal revision, like with any other work. But the the, the story with Galaxy Zoo is that uh, the data are public, and then uh, I think it was um, amateur astronomers discovered that systematically there were green, very green objects in the fields, and uh, the astronomers thought they were they never had seen we never had seen those. So said this is an, a fault in the plate, but the amateur astronomers started seeing this fault in the plates too often and trying to, to gather all, the, all kind of other kind of observations. And at the end, 
thanks to the people without bias, this this really gave a big uh, result for for science. So I think we should take into our account the bias we do have when we are in the same field. But oh. it's not easy. It's not easy. <laughs> Okay, I think we will continue during a okay. break. The, the only thing, let, let me ask uh, a very simple we have question. Eva. What? Eva was also writing. Yeah, there, there are several questions, but okay, I sorry. think we are, <laughs> yeah, we are yeah. running out of time. Then let me make a very quick question. I mean, you mentioned in your talk that uh, large facilities are already an opportunity. Are they also a source of conflict in, in the sense that we know that there are some facilities that they don't even have an, an archive, for example? Yes, well, that, that's why I think the role of reference uh, uh, observatories like the SKA can really make a change because we know how how we work. And if there is an important observatory setting a trend, many others will follow it. And if uh, for the first time the SKA finds a way to measure reproducibility, then this can be used for other observatories. So. Sometimes it's the lack of interest. Sometimes it's the lack of incentive. And sometimes the incentive doesn't have to be fair. It can be like, oh, this other one is doing it. I'm going to do it. Sometimes the lack of incentive is uh, is uh, funding. So again, as, as in the UNESCO slide, this is a very complicated thing with many factors. We cannot really blame people or institutions always by being closed. There are some different kind of factors, I think. I know that there are more questions. Sorry, we can continue during the coffee break. In Zoom, choose the one you prefer. I think Naim is there. Do you want yes to make a question? Yes. I think yes. Okay. Mortiza Pashapurama. I mean, let's make a question. Let's yeah. give the yeah. opportunity. Okay. okay. Sorry, I have a, a quick question. So uh, my, my last name is a, a little uh, long, so it's, it's hard to uh, pronounce it. Uh, uh, thank you for your interesting talk. Uh, I just ask you, yeah, in, in, in cosmology or in uh, astronomy uh, community, it's it's okay. Sometimes there is no some interest. So, But in another uh, fields of uh, 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 science, there is sometimes uh, the interest of some companies and such things or some institutions, so they don't want to share the things uh, with, with other people. So uh, do, do you think how, how could we uh, uh, um, uh, uh, remove or these barriers such, such like this uh, interest and seeing such things? If you go, be, you mean be, if you go beyond academia, how do you? Yeah. Can get <laughs> well, yeah. So it's, it's just sorry, sorry. It's a general uh, question. It's not about the academy and such things, or or not about in in our area in astronomy or such. Mm -hmm. So because here uh, there is uh, some. I, I I have a I have a, a concrete uh, example uh, like about the uh, uh, vaccination or such things. So they don't to sh share the, the the open the science. You no. Know? Yes. I well. In fact, there are two factors here. This one is the economy, and, and the other is the the data um, uh, privacy, the um, data protection. And this is something we don't have in astronomy, and it's, it happens in other disciplines. And we were speaking about that with with Nacha at the beginning that uh, one needs to make very clear how protected are the data and uh, how all the process is used, et cetera, so that the personal information is going to be disclosed. And uh, so how to how to change, uh, how to force things to be open when there is um, a big gain in keeping it closed? I don't I really don't know how to how to do it. I know how to do it. Um, in academia, because in academia you have other kind of incentives, but private companies, for example, I don't know. I, I would be happy to hear any opinion in the in the audience from tutors or other people, because I don't really know how I would I would fix that. I don't know if you have a. It's, it's really a, a very difficult problem, and uh, and we know that that pharmaceutics, for example, do not share a lot of things. I wouldn't know how to change it. Sorry. Yeah, no, okay. thank you. Thank you. That was just yeah. as well. Sorry for that. Because it's already five minutes late then.